I walk a straight line, shackled and chained. Oh, gruesome Gertie is calling my name. There is no mercy in this penitentiary. Just ask the Hill String Gang, Rango. Welcome back to another edition of Bloody Angola, a podcast, 142 years in the making, the complete story of America's bloodiest prison. I am Jim Chapman. Woody Everton will not be with us this week. He is hunting. Uh, He brought a bunch of guys down from Wisconsin, and they're in the deep south, and they are hunting hogs. For the next several days, and uh, so I'm going to be doing this one solo, but I'm going to be telling you about someone that I personally have been wanting to tell a story on for quite a while. It is a guy by the name of Wilbert Rito. Rito is really a prime example of someone who accomplished more behind bars than maybe any one inmate in history, and I'm talking about every prison, uh, his accomplishments inside of prison and behind, especially behind that wire in bloody Angola are just flat out unbelievable. Uh, he won some of journalism's most prize awards, y'all. He won the Robert F. Kennedy Award for journalism, the George Polk Award. Uh, the Sin- Sidney Hillman Award. He was the first prisoner to ever win the American Bar Association Silver Gavel Award. Uh, the Angolite, which he became the editor of, was the first prison publication ever to be nominated for a National Magazine Award. And it was nominated seven times, y'all. He was also credited uh, with bringing a lot of the reform form to Angola uh, during the 1970s, the bloody years. He traveled the state as a lecturer. And get this, he was allowed to travel the state to do those lectures and was only accompanied by an unarmed guard and was even permitted to fly to Washington, D.C. twice to address newspaper editors at conferences in Washington, D.C., specifically on the subject of prison journalism. So this guy had a lot of rope, if you will. Uh, Rito was a former associate editor of the Angolite. And get this, Rito, along with a former associate editor of the Angolite named Ron Wigberg and the University of Louisiana at Lafayette, known as ULL, a professor there by the name of Burke Foster, they put together a criminal justice textbook that is now in its fourth edition, and y'all, it's still used today in Louisiana. Uh, Redu and Wickberg, they also collaborated on life sentences, and a 1992 anthology of articles from the Angolite, now out of print, Uh, It was a book that they released. So he has done some amazing things in his life in prison. As a matter of fact, he was named Person of the Week by Peter Jennings on World News Tonight in August of 1992. At that time, that was that was the news show. And Peter Jennings was the uh, I guess you'd say stud anchor of all of TV at that time. So he. 
had a reputation for excellence. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about his upbringing. And he was born in Louisiana in 1942. Now, when he was six, his family moved to Lake Charles, Louisiana, and that's in Calcasieu Parish. Y'all, it's in the west part of the state. Uh, and it's just about 30 miles, probably, from the Texas border. He attended a uh, public school. And back in those days, it, they were segregated. This is this is the late, uh, the, well, mid to late 50s. And uh, all these schools were segregated. So uh, he attended elementary school at a segregated school. And then he started at W.O. Boston High School when he was in the eighth grade. But he soon started skipping classes, y'all. And at 13, he gets a job at a grocery store and he just quits going to school altogether. At that time, he hadn't even finished the ninth grade. He also started becoming involved in petty crime. So, you're talking about someone that that grew up very poor. He starts working at this grocery store, probably got a little money. And you know how it is when you're 13, 14 years old. If you have 20 bucks, you you feel like a millionaire and you can make it the rest of your life on that. And I'm, I guess that's where he was at. But sadly, uh, he started becoming involved in petty crime. Then when he was 19, uh, he committed an armed bank robbery in Lake Charles. That was in 1961. Uh, so we're going to tell you about that crime. It's a very important part of this story. I'm going to really detail this for you. So Wilbert Rideau arrives at Gulf National Bank. That's in Lake Charles, y'all. And it was 6.30 p.m. It was on a, on February 16th of 1961. He had taken a city bus to get there. He didn't have a vehicle at that time. But he had prearranged a ride from a store that was just across the way from that bank at 7.30. And he had on his mind he was going to rob a bank. He hadn't made it his mind up 100%. But it was so he was going to kind of stake it out and see if he thought he could get away with it. He knew that bank closed at seven. He had been in that bank several times before and had paid attention to people's names and stuff. And it's all going to play a part in this story. So he knew that bank closed at seven and he made up his mind at that time that if no customers were in that bank when it closed, he was going to rob it. Now, y'all, he realizes really quick that he don't have a bag to put money in. So he goes to that store that was across the way from that bank and he purchases a blue suitcase. And then he exits the back of the store rather than going out of the front of that store because it's, it's quicker to get to the bank from the back exit. And also he figured nobody would see him going out the front and be able to place him at that bank. So he checks his watch again, and he realizes it's 6.55. That bank closes at 7, and, and Redu knows that he has a decision to make. It was dark. He didn't see any customers, but he wasn't really sure if any were actually in the bank or not. And he's actually in the rear entrance of that bank, the back side of that building. And in these days, uh. I guess they weren't as cautious as they do now. I mean, they lock those doors in the back of those banks now, obviously. But in this, uh, in this day and time, I guess they didn't do that. And at that time, he kind of reaches in his pants pocket, and he makes sure that the gun that he had brought with him was accessible. And he makes up his mind and enters the rear entrance of that bank. So when he enters that rear entrance, he finds himself in a hallway. And I want you want y'all to picture this. It's a long hallway and it's got offices on both sides of it that are staggered. So he's walking down that hallway. He's not really sure if uh, those offices are going to be filled with people, but it, you know, too late to turn back now, right? So he walks down that hallway and no one's in any of those offices and he stops at the end of that hallway. 
and he sets that suitcase down and it's right next to the vault. And then he steps into the lobby of that bank and he sees two female tellers sitting there at the, at the cages, as they call them, the cash cages. And he's kind of surprised. He didn't expect because he had uh, been in that bank several times before with the plans of robbing it. He didn't expect two tellers to be there. Usually there was only one teller there and then the bank manager. But in this case, there were two that kind of surprised him. So they look up at him and because he had paid attention to names uh, going in that bank several times before, he knew the bank manager's name was Mr. Hickman. He had heard a teller refer to the bank manager as that before. So he tells both tellers that he needed to speak with Mr. Hickman. So the tellers look at him and they kind of point to an office near the front entrance of that bank. And Mr. Hickman is in there and he's sitting at his desk. So Rito sticks his head inside that office and he tells Mr. Hickman that a woman was in the back of the bank and she was asking to see him. And Mr. Hickman, he, he kind of believes us because how would Rito know his name? Otherwise he had never seen Wilbert before. So in his mind, someone must be really asking for Mr. Hickman. It didn't raise a whole lot of questions you know, alarms with him and he gets up, leaves his desk and heads to that hallway to access the back of that bank. So as he's walking down that hallway, Rito suddenly shoves him into a coffee room and the bank manager at this point realizes, Oh shit, something ain't right. He kind of starts to panic and Rido sees this and he tells that bank manager, hey, look, man, I just want the money. No one's going to get hurt. Uh, and he pulls the gun from his pants pocket. So the two bank tellers appear to be oblivious to all this. And they're just making their way to the coffee room kind of to gather their things. It's after seven o'clock now. The bank's closing. They're getting their purses and whatnot. Uh, maybe their lunch that, you know, they had that day, uh, and they're going home. So they go to that coffee room and you can imagine their shock. These two female bank tellers, when they see Rito standing there and he's got a gun pointed at the bank manager. So Rito kind of freaks out. He didn't expect them to interrupt that. And he orders all three out of the room. He basically points the gun at all three of them. And he says, okay, we're going to go out of this room and I'm going to get my money and get out of here. So they leave the room and they turn to head back to the lobby and collect the money. But as soon as they hit that hallway, the phone rings. Now, initially Rito tells the bank manager, do not answer that phone. But the bank manager says, if I don't answer the phone, it's going to appear really suspicious and the cops are going to come. And Rito thinks about it for a second and he says, you're right. Answer the phone, but don't you dare do anything to raise a red flag and have the cops come over here. So the bank manager, he answers the phone and the person on the other end, the first thing they ask that bank manager is if everything is okay at the bank. And the manager, he answers with, okay, I'll be down in a few minutes. Then the caller realizes he didn't answer my question correctly. Something's wrong. So he says, do you need a cop down there? And Hickman gives a real vague response. And the caller says, we're going to go ahead and send the cops. And then Hickman tells the person on the other line, I'll call you right back and hangs up. But there was a problem here. Rito overheard that conversation. He he overheard the voice on the other end of that phone, and he really starts panicking. He knows the jig is up, the cops are on the way, and he has no time. So he tells Hickman, he throws the suitcase at him. He says, fill the suitcase. Now, the women at this time, the two bank tellers, they're standing by the teller cages, and the manager starts filling that suitcase with cash. 
And Rito tells him, you know, don't play around with them one dollar bills either. I want those hundreds in there. And and so there's he's steady filling it. Uh Rito, as a matter of fact, was in such a hurry, he didn't even bother to go to the vault. Whatever was in those cash cages, that's what he was gonna leave with. He didn't have he felt like he didn't have time to go to the vault. So that suitcase gets filled up. And out of really more instinct than anything else, he tells the bank tellers and the manager to follow him out of the bank. He realizes at this time, I don't have a car. My ride is not going to be here for another 20 minutes. The cops are on the way. So he orders one of those tellers. He says, give me the, give me, uh, the keys to your car. Where is your car? Uh, and she points it out. And she hands him the keys and then he hands them back to her and he says, you're going to drive. And they go to the car and it's a little bitty car. It's a basically like a Volkswagen. Uh, so that's disappointing to him because now you have two female bank tellers and a bank manager in yourself. And you got to all four fit in this vehicle that it's going to be really tight. He tells one of the female uh, bank tellers to drive. He tells the other to get in the passenger seat, and he shoves the bank manager in the back seat, and he gets back there with the bank manager with the gun pointed on the bank manager. And they start driving, and Rito is a little bit confused about where he's at. He's not used to this part of town. It's kind of a rit- ritzy part of town. It's... Uh, you know, back in those days, it was segregated, y'all. And uh, this was kind of like the white part of town, if you will, back in those days. And he was used to more of the downtown area where uh, it was it was more of the black part of town in those days. And so he tells them, he says, head for downtown where he knew the streets. He knew where he could hide out. He had no idea at this point, according to him, what he was going to even do with them. And they drive, and after about 15 minutes of driving, they come to a small bridge. And they had to slow down to kind of go over this bridge. The bank teller, the female bank teller in, you know, driving the vehicle, slams on the brakes and she jumps out of the vehicle. So the vehicle comes to a stop. Rito jumps out to give chase. And while he's doing that, Hickman jumps out and he lunges at Rito in an effort to disarm him. So Rito starts shooting because at this point, all three of them are out of the car and all three of them fall to the ground. Now, Rito then realizes one of the bank tellers is still alive. And the way that he realized that was she was she was shot and she laid on the ground and then she kind of tried to push herself up to get back on her feet. And as she struggles to lift herself off the ground, he remembers that he had a hunting knife in his pocket in one of his other pockets. So he pulls the hunting knife out and he stabs her in the throat. So severely injured in that incident were Jay Hickman, who was the bank manager, and Dora McCain, who was one of the bank tellers. Sadly, killed in that incident uh, was Julia Ferguson, the other bank teller. So it was found out later, y'all, that Dora, one of the surviving bank tellers, got suspicious when... Rito entered that bank and walked off with Mr. Hickman after he stuck his head in that office. And she called the operator. Yep. This is remember y'all, this is 1961. And in those days they had switchboard operators. You could actually dial zero and this operator would pick up. So she did that and said, there may be trouble at the bank. And basically, can you check back with us in a couple of minutes and just make sure everything is copacetic, if you will. I wanted to put that in there to let you know how that operator even knew to call back and say, do y'all need help at the bank? So Rito, he takes off running and Hickman and the other bank teller, the surviving bank teller, they were playing dead. They realize that he's kind of out of sight, and they get up, and they take off running the other direction. Hickman then flags down a car, the bank manager, 
and the police who are already they're already looking for these employees because they see you know the bank completely unlocked when they got there and they knew something wasn't right uh they were close behind they eventually catch up to Rito just a few hours after the incident and they haul him into jail for questioning now Lake Charles was a much smaller town than it is now. Everybody kind of knew everybody. And it was like no time before people heard about this. And by the time they get to jail, by the time the the police catch Rito, which was only a few hours later, and haul him to jail, there's already a TV station crew there. And there's a mob of people, you know, uh, in they're wanting justice like right away. Let's just put it that way. So Rito gets hauled into uh, the interrogation room. In what would be really a key component in this whole case, a TV crew stands outside that interrogation room and they actually film the interrogation, complete with Rito's confession of killing one of those bank tellers. So over the next few days of that TV station airing what I would call the questioning of Wilbert Rito, that showing gets over 100,000 views just from people in the area that watched it, just for people in that West Louisiana area. So eventually Rito goes to trial in and he is charged with first degree murder of Julia Ferguson. And in 1961, he gets sentenced to death via gruesome Gertie at bloody Angola. But Rito appeals that verdict. And the appeal stated that basically the pretrial publicity failed to get him a fair trial. Specifically, he referenced that news uh, filming that I just told you about where 100,000 nearby residents watched his interrogation. And the whole gist of that appeal was there's no way people weren't influenced by that. And look, I I would agree with that. Uh, It doesn't mean he didn't do it, but... Definitely, that probably didn't help the situation, right? So he gets a new trial, and he is again found guilty in 1964 by another jury and again sentenced to death for the first degree murder of that bank teller. Then that conviction gets overturned by another appeal. And Rito was tried a third time in 1970. Rito was then convicted, y'all, a third time of first degree murder. So three times he's had a chance to kind of get out of that uh, conviction, and three times he's failed, and all three times he was convicted of first degree murder. Now, During all of these appeals, Rito was claiming that the murder was not premeditated and it was a result of panic. You know, he was trying to attempting to put a face on that. Hey, I'm a good guy. I made a really bad decision and things went haywire and I had no plans on shooting or killing anybody. It's just kind of the way it happened, but it was all due to panic. So it's important to note that if you're convicted of first degree murder, it it has to include premeditation. It it can't be a spur of the moment thing. So that was his argument there. But but <laughs> I want y'all to listen to this little known interview I was able to get my hands on that was actually recorded in 1981. Now it's a little lengthy. It's just over nine minutes. But I want you to listen to Wilbert Rido in his own words, y'all. This is his own words, and that is important, very important to all of this. Um, in my opinion, it describes what I would call a more cold-blooded act than an act out of sheer panic as he was trying to 
you know, say relative to whether he deserved the death penalty. So here is that interview, and you judge for yourself if this sounded like an act of panic or just a flat-out act of the attempted murder of two and the murder of one. Here's that clip. I know what else to do. And you, you, you shot all three of them, and one of them died. Yeah. Okay, but one you didn't cut their throat. I yeah. was told you cut their yeah, throat. Yeah, one. You cut one? That's the one who died. Oh. Why did you do that? Rather than shoot that person? I think I ran out of bullets. Okay, so that you took four. No, three. you took three. Right. Shot two and killed the other one. Right. I know I've asked you a lot of questions about it. just interesting about why you would want to kill them when they hadn't done anything to you, or am no, I not in the right frame to, of mind to understand what you're saying? Okay, you have to understand what happened. Okay, back then, like Billy pointed out, I was the same way. I was criminal. I mean, I needed to be locked up even before I committed the crime. How old were you when you did it? Because I was it? dangerous. I was 19 years old. I just made it. And uh, aside from being criminal, uh, Back then, I happened to, the fact that I hated white people added an extra dimension to the whole affair. I mean, you are not that concerned about the humanity of people you hate, which is why it's so easy for people to execute people and everything else. Uh, I didn't particularly care about my own safety. I didn't care about anything. I was confused and dangerous. And I should have been locked up. Had they locked me up for any reason before then, this would have never happened. Are you rolling a home? Okay. Let me ask you this one question. Do you think um, you got the death sentence, right? Mm -hmm. And it was not obviously not imposed. Uh, did, were you ever brought over to the death house for the for the whole syndrome to begin? No. No. And in in '72, we've talked about those particular kinds of changes that took place. Should you have been executed for what you did? Uh, yeah. Why? Because if you're going to have a law, you've got to enforce it. And there are two, there are two uh, sides to this thing. I've been locked up 20 years. I don't know when I'm going to get out. I mean, looking at it just from my own vested interest in it. Uh, people and perhaps society, because this is primarily a Christian society, people operate on the mistaken notion of, you know, a life sentence, imposing a life sentence on people is, some, is a type of charity. I mean, you're keeping somebody locked up for the rest of his life, suffering for the sheer sake of suffering, you know, just to appease the, the vengeance impulses and desires. Uh, he's going to suffer for 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years. The only piece he's ever going to know from his suffering is a piece of grave. I see no sense in prolonging suffering like that. So I you're mean, if you're going to be merciful, in that particular instance, if you're going to keep somebody locked up forever, death penalty is, is mercy. So you're saying if society feels it has a right to revenge and decides to take the right to revenge, then the only merciful way to the right to revenge is to execute the criminal rather than keep him locked up. Yeah, because it's like Warden Blackburn pointed out earlier today. You're killing him anyway. If you give a man a life sentence and keep him in, in prison for his entire life, it's just another form of death. It's just that this one is more excruciating than the other because he's going to suffer for the rest of his life. Do you think you should be let out? I think so. Why? Uh, I'm no longer a danger to anybody, and I feel that, uh, as Billy pointed out, if you have a system that provides for release under certain, under certain criteria, if you're going to let everybody else out, why not Wilbert Rito? Wilbert Rito has been locked up now longer than 99.910% of all the prisoners in the history of the Louisiana penal system, period. And why not accord me the same Robert. treatment you accord everybody else? I've, I've established a record that's uh, a record of achievement that's unmatched in the history of this state. Uh, now, I didn't ask way. you. I didn't ask you if you think the death penalty is wrong. We discussed that it's more merciful than a life sentence. Is the death penalty wrong? 
I personally, and that's what you're asking me, do I believe in it? I personally don't believe in, in capital punishment. That's my personal belief. But I recognize the fact that it's a reality that you can't ignore, and that is that people demand an extreme punishment. They demand the ability. Maybe they won't exercise it all the time, but they want to be able to, whenever they do, desire to do it, to impose it. And a good example of, uh, of what happens when you de deprive them of it is the last execution here in Louisiana was in 1962, Justice James Ferguson. Since then, they haven't executed anybody. Okay, up until then, the state of Louisiana was the most lenient in the entire United States on criminals. Since then, the Louisiana State Penitentiary has, experienced, has registered a 100% increase in the number of new life commitments every three years. Right now, you have 914 people serving life sentences. That's not counting all the 99 years, the 50 years, and the two lives and whatnot. That's what happens when you don't give them their two or three or four people they want to execute. They search for another extreme punishment, and that is life imprisonment. Why do you think capital punishment is wrong? We discussed the need for it. We discussed the rationale behind it. Why do you personally believe it is wrong? Because when I sat on that death row, when I lived on that death row for 13 years, death row, at the very beginning, you know, my wanting to live and, you know, my pleas for mercy, you know, being just falling on deaf ears, it made me realize, you know, what my victim must have felt like. Because I did the same thing to her. I ignored her pleas and everything. And, you know, it was sort of like a role reversal, a reversal of roles. And somehow in that just came, you know, came an appreciation for life and the thin line that separates the living from the dead. And I wish there was some other way. I mean, I know you've got problems. You know, society has problems. They've got to do something with uh, John Wayne Gacy's. They've got to do something with people who kill 10, 15, 20 people. And I find a lot of times I hear something over the news and I, you know, my impulse is the same as the average citizen. You know, it's so, what I hear is so horrendous, so repulsive that, uh, yeah, he should get the death penalty. When I think about it, no. Uh, but I recognize that society has to have an extreme punishment. I recognize that if, if, you, if you deprive them of it, they're gonna subject an awful lot of people to living debts with extremely long sentences. So, you know, it's sort of practicality demand, rather than have hundreds suffer living debts, go on and give them their three or four physical debts that they won't. And like Bella said, give it to them because they deserve it. In other words, it will release. I'm going to be a writer and uh, also a magazine editor. I have job offers and uh, I'm also on the contract to Doubleday Publishing to write for them for the first year. That's and what I want to be. I want to be a writer. Now what about that? A successful that? one. I mean, however, Governor Edwards pardon is, uh, committed the time of his uh, gardener, Forrest Hammond, who had only served six years. He was convicted of murder and served a life sentence incidentally. And the flack that, you know, the publicity and all that, the political flack that came behind it. Well, my case was coming up the next week. And uh, if he reduces it to 30 years and the parole board says, I mean to 60 years, and the parole board says no, well, I've got to do, what, 10 more years for discharge. So you think it would, if your case comes up at the right time, A lot of it, yeah, that's almost with anybody. So what are you thinking? Sound like an, just an innocent guy to you who made a huge one-time mistake? Now, 
By the time he conducted that interview, Rito was already making quite the name for himself in Angola. And he really started gaining his fame in the early 1970s by writing a column called The Jungle. And it was for a chain of weekly newsletters in Louisiana. And he freelanced articles even to mainstream media. He freelanced some stuff for the Shreveport Journal and even Penthouse Magazine. Um, a headline at one point referred to him as the word man of Angola, uh, saying basically that Rito is Angola's version of the Birdman of Alcatraz. And y'all, if you're not familiar with the story of the Birdman, he was an Alcatraz convict who was estimated to have a genius or near genius level IQ. Good stuff for him, right? So all of these feats, especially in the form of writing, they were amazing considering Rido had not even gone beyond the ninth grade, y'all, in his formal education before his arrest and incarceration. He educated himself almost exclusively by just reading, reading, reading in prison. You don't have a whole lot to do in prison, right? You work out, you eat, and you read. I mean, those are the things that you do. And look, he took big advantage of that. So a big break for Rado occurs in 1972 and he actually gets his sentence commuted from death to life in prison. And this was due to federal courts basically ordering the states to reexamine all of their death penalty cases. And he gets a, a lucky break and that sentence gets commuted to life in prison then in 1975, a federal court orders a complete reform of Angola. And we talked about this on the show before. And that reform was likely a direct result of a civil suit filed by the ACLU because of the high level of violence and abuse of prisoners' rights inside the prison. That was their claim. But no matter, uh, you know, reform was on the way. And the consent decree that the state had with the federal government required the prison to institute desegregation of programs and work assignments. Even in 1975, they were still uh, segregated for almost all intents and purposes at Louisiana State Penitentiary in Angola. And the federal government basically said, you, you know, you need to have some intermingling here with the races. So the outgoing warden, he appoints Rito as the editor of the Angolite. This was a big deal. Uh, the Angolite probably at that time was the me most well-known prison publication in the country. Um, but also of a big deal was he was the first African-American editor of any prison journal in the United States. There was not one in the United States that had an African-American editor. Huge deal. Made a lot of uh, papers and things like that. And Rito flat out just started becoming famous. Now, this warden had what would be described as a progressive administration. Um, and the warden went to Rito. And he says, look, I'm not going to censor your publication. So during his 25 years as editor, Rito became well known uh, for having an uncensored publication. Now, was it really uncensored, y'all? Eh, I kind of have my doubts on that. I don't think a warden is going to let anything ultra negative get out in the Angolite. That's that's uh, my opinion. I have no direct knowledge one way or the other, but it was claimed to be uncensored. Now, in 1979, Rito applies for full clemency, okay? And he was flat out denied. It was his right. He, You can apply for full clemency, uh, and it's their right to deny you, and that's just what the parole board did in 1979. So Rito moves on 
and he keeps building that reputation, y'all, himself. And Billy Sinclair, which we'll talk about him for a second. He was the editor just before Rito. And they strike, they had a, a, I guess, an amazing friendship. You would, uh, you would describe it as a mutual respect for each other. Uh, they actually won an award together and that award is known as the Polk award. Now y'all, the Polk award in journalism at that time was probably the most prestigious of all awards for magazine journalism. So they are, um, they are shooting stars. So fast forward to the early eighties, <laughs> Rido becomes more and more popular, probably the most famous convict in the country. And in 1985, he gets another clemency hearing. Now, in that hearing, his mother, Gladys Simeon, makes an emotional speech to the parole board. And here's what that sounded like. Reuben has been uh, away from home for 23 years, 10 months, and three days today. And I've been in a, a whole lot of struggles since then. People call, call me up and tell me they was going to burn the house, park me at the house and curse and use all kind of languages. Call on the phone, curse me out and hang up. And I visit him all th through this time. And he often told me, he says, Mother, he said, I'm sorry for what happened. And, uh, and have to put you through all this problem. And he said, if I can ever make up for it, he said, I will uh, show you different. And at that time, I had a baby three months old. And I visited him with her all through this time. And he's seen her grow up. She is now 24 years old. And every time I go visit him, I take her with me. And now she is uh, doing for herself, and she visit him on her own now. And uh, I told my family that if I would happen to die before we were that uh, never to let him know, because I never wanted him to come back to Lake Charles. The people had too much bitterness in Lake Charles bars. So I'm sorry not to be able to say more, but I thank each and every one that is here on his behalf. So after she spoke, a journalist from Lake Charles, where the martyrs of Julia Ferguson took place as well as the attempted murders of the other bank teller and the bank manager. This journalist spoke really for the victims and for the people of Lake Charles. And it was a, he brought up some interesting points and he held nothing back. And here's what that sounded like. The people that were taken into this crime, the victims of crime, which they brought up a moment ago, and I'm glad they brought the victims up, even in the Angoli, that's terrific. Those three people that were involved, including the dead one, Julia Ferguson, and while they talk about how long Mr. Rideau has suffered at Angola, the punishment, is it enough? I try to wonder when it will end for Julia Ferguson, who has been to the ground ever since the night of that thing in February 1961. I also try to think about the other two people that were left there for dead at the scene. What happens to them? I have never found as a reporter, and I asked a lot of the immediate families that I could contact, they're so small. Who ever got a word from Mr. Rideau of remorse, regret, or sadness to them? I've heard the Reverend and all talk about how they expressed it. And if I was in Mr. Rideau's position at Angola, certainly I would be a very good worker because that is a job that he's done well and he's done it so well 
that they should keep him at Angola to set the example for the other fellows who don't care to try to do well. So as you heard there, that guy wasn't playing. I mean, he was letting the parole board know that the people of Lake Charles and the you know the victims that he had spoke to and the victims' families did not want uh, Wilbert Rito to get clemency. And finally, Rick Bryant spoke. He was the DA for Calcasieu Parish at that time, and he reads a statement from an actual victim, uh, Dora McCain. If y'all remember, that's the surviving bank teller from that tragic night. And here is what that actual statement was, as read by Rick Bryant. Wilbert Rideau was tried for murder by a jury three times and given the death penalty each time. I had to testify for the state of Louisiana and had to remember and relive the horrible experience of each of these trials. I went away from each trial with the assurance given by the DA and representatives of the state that he would no longer be a threat to me nor to society. Justice would prevail. Wilbert Rideau took a life and he intended to take three lives. As the years passed, I hurt more and more from the bone fragments in my spine caused by the bullet he shot into my spine. And I hurt very much whenever I think of what my life would have been had he not kidnapped and shot me. I think of the things I could never do as a result of the gunshot, and I remember the horrible things that he did to Julia and me that night. I can never forget them. The bottom line is the fact that this man murdered another human being, and now he is credited with certain accomplishments. But do these accomplishments guarantee a murderer his freedom? Or did he forfeit his freedom when he cut Julia's throat that night and ruined our lives? So after that clemency hearing, the pardon board, they go and they vote, and they actually unanimously vote that Redo's sentence should be commuted from life Remember, it had already been commuted from the death sentence to life in prison. Well, they vote unanimously that that sentence be commuted from life to time served and Rito to be released from Angola. But, but the governor of Louisiana at that time, who was Edwin Edwards, denies that request And he states that although Rito appears to be rehabilitated, his crime was too heinous to put him back into society, essentially. Um, Important to note that although the the pardon board can make a recommendation for uh, a commuted sentence and uh, grant clemency, the governor has to approve that. They get doesn't matter that they voted unanimously uh, that his sentence be commuted from life to time served. The governor has to sign off on that or it don't happen. And in this case, it did not. Now, 2020, which ABC TV's 2020, I'm sure everybody's familiar with that. They reveal later on that the governor made a secret promise to surviving bank teller Dora McCain that he would never release Rito. So it's still in prison for Rito and on that life sentence. And in the 1990s, uh, Rito is actually described by Life magazine as the most rehabilitated prisoner in America. Y'all, that's how popular he was. He also branched out in the 1990s and, and got into radio television, and even documentary filmmaking. He becomes a correspondent for National Public Radio, uh, produced a segment for ABC TV's new ma- news magazine called, it was a news magazine called Day One, and he even collaborated with a radio documentarian uh, for a piece entitled Tossing Away the Keys. Uh, He collaborated, created, and produced two documentary films, one called Final Judgment, The Execution of Antonio James. Let me tell you, I've seen that. It is an amazing documentary. That was in 1996. Uh, And he also uh, produced, created, and collaborated on The 
Farm, which is probably the best documentary out there in history on Louisiana State Penitentiary at Angola. That was produced in 1998. Just amazing work by this guy inside of Angola, regardless of it, of his crimes in the heinousness of it. Um, he was a rock star in prison. The form actually won an Emmy award and get this was nominated for an Academy award. I mean, Rido is world famous by this point and he's in a cell in Louisiana State Penitentiary in Angola. Hey, as he should be, he murdered somebody. But what a shame. Things are about to really change in this story, y'all. And I'm going to pick it up next week. There's just too much left to go into everything with just one episode. And I want to make sure that I do this story justice. It's about to flip and do a 360. So you're not going to believe what you hear next week. Now, we want to thank everyone, Woody and I, who support us via Patreon. We can't do it without you. Plain and simple. Can't do it without you. All of these things cost time, tons of time and money. And, uh, you know, it's a business, y'all. And and we can't thank you enough for providing enough support to help us continue telling these stories from Louisiana State Penitentiary in Angola. Now, totally get it. If you're unable to become a patron member, you, there's other ways you can support the show. Please share the links with others if you're enjoying the content and let them know you're enjoying it. Maybe it'll be something they want to check out too. Incidentally, y'all, I do have a couple of podcasts I do solo. If you're a crime fan, you will love Exposed Scandalous Files of the Elite. You can find that on any audio platform. Seven episodes are currently out, and next week I'm diving into the scandalous files of Sean Combs, also known, well, back in my day, he was known as Puff Daddy. Now he's known as P. Diddy. But, y'all, what is unfolding right now with this piece of shit is probably worse than the Epstein case, if you can imagine that, which I thought I would never see. I'm telling you, Hollywood and music moguls have completely went off the fucking chain. And I'm going to tell you all about that. So look for that next week. And if you're a business minded person and you have an interest in how others built their business, or if you just want to check out and hear, hear the stories of family and businesses who are doing great things, uh, Check out Local Leaders, the podcast. That was my very first podcast. I started way back in 2019. You can listen everywhere, but um, our largest platform by far is YouTube by, by a mile. And that podcast is video. So you can see the emotion involved between the family and business owners that sit down with me. Uh I think that's why people really like the YouTube better. You can you can feel their passion for their business. It's a really neat podcast. Uh, I've got close to 200 episodes that I've done of Local Leaders of Podcast. So please check that out. And, of course, Real Life, Real Crime, Woody Everton Staple. You know, the, the podcast that started it all, really, for Bloody Angola and so many other things that we've done together. Check that out. I don't need to tell you about that. Y'all know about Real Life for a Crime, of course, and Real Life for a Crime Daily, uh, which is a podcast hosted by myself, Woody Overton, and Mike Agavino, four days a week. And we talk about current crime news, everything that's going on in the headlines, the crime headlines. We cover those, give you our thoughts in kind of a comedic way when it's appropriate and a not so comedic way when that's appropriate. So, Check that out. And until next time, I'm Jim Chapman. For Woody Everton, we are your host of Bloody Angola, a podcast 142 years in the making, the complete story of America's bloodiest prison. Peace. I walk a straight line 
shackled chain. Oh, gruesome Gertie is calling my name. There is no mercy in this penitentiary. Just ask the Hill String Gang, Wrangle the Three.